when I see like the ribbons or the puzzle pieces or the save people from autism and, you know, this one weird trick will help you cure your autistic child. Um, that I think that's why I get so, cause you would never see this one weird trick will save you from being Italian. Yeah. Like, yeah. Huh. Save the Canadians. <laughs> right. Exactly. If we could only capture the feces of Canada goose and feed them pulpated to the Canadian people, they will become like the rest of us in North America. <laughs> Welcome to the Autistic Culture Podcast. Each episode, we dive deep into autistic contributions to society and culture by introducing you to some of the world's most famous and successful autistics in history. Before we get started, a quick disclaimer on how we use the word autistic. The purpose of this show is not to diagnose the people or characters we discuss as autistic. While some may have announced being autistic, what we're sharing here is our observation of what is representative of autistic culture. It can sometimes be difficult for autistic people to celebrate our natural tendencies and traits due to the perception of autism as a disorder that needs to be fixed, a long history of damaging medical interventions to try and get us to fit in with mainstream culture, and protective masking skills many of us have developed to try to stay safe. Whether you are autistic or just love someone who is, your host is Dr. Angela Loria, the linguistic autistic and licensed psychological practitioner, Matt Lowry, welcome you to take this time to be fully immersed in the language, values, traditions, norms, and identity of Autistica. Autistica. Episode 23, Dimensions of Autistic Culture. This one's going to be exciting. This is exciting, Matt. We uh, boldly named our podcast the Autistic Culture Podcast. Uh, we, I think, both had individually reached some conclusions that autism was a culture. But at least for me, you got the fancy degree. Um, at least for me, there wasn't a science necessarily behind it. It was a little more of a hunch or a feeling or... The connecting way. a pattern, yes, that we had our way. And I had thought it before, but there was a moment where it all came together for me. And that moment was when I heard you read the land of Aut the legend of Autistica. So I want to uh, yes. start this episode by talking a little about what that is. I, uh, by the way, I heard you on Meg Proctor's two sides of the spectrum, which is an amazing podcast. And if you're not subscribed, go do that too. Cause I'll put it in the show notes, uh, major inspiration for me. Um, but what is the legend of Autistica? It brought it all together for me. So give us a little backstory. That was a short story I actually wrote about a year ago because every people has a legend of how they came to be. The Greeks, the Romans, uh, the, the whole Romulus and Remus thing. And because we are a people, we needed a legend of our own. And that's why I wrote about the land of Autistica and the legend of Autismix, the person who brought everything together. And uh, we've since updated it, so it might be worthwhile re-recording it at some point because we, we've made some additional, you know, Let's stuff do to that it. as a special episode because I, it, the first version that I heard was about 20 minutes. I mean, it's it deserves an episode of its own, I think, so that it can be found. Especially because we've added dragons. Yeah, and now, yes, now complete with dragons. Uh, oh, yeah. That was a watershed moment for me because... I guess no one to, that I knew, I obviously have not read everything in every language, but nobody I knew had voiced the origin story of our people. And once we had that, I was like, I know what it is. We're a culture, not a disease. Yes. And that's why so. when I see like the ribbons or the puzzle pieces or the save people from autism, and, you know, this one weird trick will help you cure your autistic child. Um, that I think that's why I get so, because you would never see this one weird trick will save you from being Italian. 
Yeah, Thank yeah. <laughs> Save the Canadians. <laughs> right, exactly. If we could only capture the feces of Canada goose and feed them pulpated to the Canadian people, they will become like the rest of us in North America. <laughs> yeah, weird maple leaf wearing people. Yeah, so... I decided for this episode, it would make sense for us to look at what is culture and then what are the aspects of culture. And obviously, in each of our episodes, when we're talking about Eminem or Star Wars or Star Trek, we're featuring an aspect of our culture. But let's co go back to the drawing board. Let's look at some social science here and say, what is a culture? So uh, I've got a pretty simple definition here that is used. I'm going to have you read it, Matt, about what is a culture. <clears throat> culture is simply a system of models or knowledge about how the world works, a construction of reality that is created, shared, and transmitted by members of a society. Views of everything from the nature of the physical universe to the structure and functioning of society, notions of gender and personhood, and proper ways for people to live with and treat each other are shaped by cultural models. What we have come to know, to believe is true or false, indeed are ways of thinking and what we think about are constructs of culture. I like that definition. Okay, what comes up for you as a part of many cultures, but autistic culture being one of the cultures that you are in? Exactly, exactly. And that's th this is a big thing about, you know, when I wrote Autistica, I, I haven't heard about this particular model, but that fits because we talk about autismics fighting against the, the masking, the, the forced masking, the lack of... Uh, ability to engage in our things. And one of the things that I, I really like about that is when autismics, uh, uh, so the, the, the person who is trying to oppress the people in the story of Autistica is Emperor Nero Typicles. And he, uh, he wants everyone to conform. He wants everyone to wear a mask. He wants everyone to avoid talking about their special interests. And he wants everyone to do these mundane tasks that that cannot be done because sometimes we just cannot do that impossible thing. And this is, this talks about the values of Nero typically imposing those values on the people of Autistica and finding a better way because we look at every one of these things differently than our neurotypical peers. Right. Um, so in the, uh, in the story, like uh, the, the structure uh, and functioning of society. Neurotypicallys and the typicales, they have a way that society should function. Mm -hmm. They are happy with it. And then you drop in the autistic people and they're like, wait, this structure and functioning of society doesn't work for me. Or we talk about the proper ways to live and treat each other. Yeah. Um, go ahead. And, and, and this is a big thing because I honestly believe that there are... So there are many, many factors at work in our current society that do not work for the majority of the people mm. here. There's a lot of uh, issues with colonialism. There's a lot of issues with capitalism. There's a lot of issues with very few people having very much of the power. And I really do think that if even neurotypical people lived in autistic ways, it would benefit them as well. Because uh, from our cultural standpoint, every one of these things is different than the majority viewpoint. And this is one of the reasons why I love meeting autistic people from all over the world, because they grow up in all these other cultures, whether it's, you know, uh, Italians or in English. I know people from Singapore and Malaysia and Australia, New Zealand, Japan. Uh, uh, Germany, India, and every single one of these different places has the autistic experience, has autistic people, and they have to fit in and conform and fight for their own rights in all sorts of different ways. So I, I, I love comparing autistic people across cultures to see what this base uh, what What is at its center, what does it mean to be autistic? If we had our own country of Autistica, what would our language yeah. be? What would our values be? What 
are the commonalities across all of these cultures that you find on every single continent. Because again, I guarantee you that there are autistic people in Ar Antarctica doing research right now. Because oh, I guarantee doing. you there are. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. The, it's I fascinating. Think this, is, this is what's fascinating because when we talk about, and this happens with intraculturally as well as interculturally, when we talk about Italian culture, Japanese culture, I don't think there's an expect expectation 100% of Japanese people are the same on all these points. 100% yeah. of Italian Americans are the same on all these points. So everything I'm about to say here is taken through a general cultural lens, not a your wife or husband or child or bestie, this is what they think about every single thing any more than this is what every Japanese person thinks about every single thing. Well, I mean, but, it's like, you know, when you come to America, uh, for those who are outside the country listening to this podcast, we as Americans, uh, part of our right as an American, part of our duty as an American is to eat as much deep fried cheese as we possibly can until true. we die of coronaries. They tell uh, us that at birth, it comes yeah, with they, a birth certificate. Exactly. If we don't eat deep fried cheese every day, we are subject to torture. That's a thing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that, but that's the thing. There are differences. There are all sorts of neat stuff. Uh, for instance, one of the neat things about being autistic in Japan, one of the upsides, you're not expected to make eye contact because that's a cultural thing. Oh, we're uh, going to talk about that. Yes. Oh, oh, wait. oh neat. Yeah. Yes. Uh, oh, okay. Oh, oh, in that case, yeah, let, let's dive in because I, I don't want to spoil things. Yeah. So, Culture drives the way you behave. Culture influences your communication in ways that aren't always obvious, like especially to me as an autistic person, it leads to a lot of lying in many cultures, looks like lying to me. Culture influences beliefs and values. It influences your personality. That was that last thing um, you read is uh, how what we see influences who we are. And cultural differences can be very difficult to bridge. And the way we talk about that here is the double empathy problem. Oh, yes. So if you're Japanese, there's nothing wrong with your culture. If you're American, there's nothing wrong. Well, in theory, there's nothing wrong with your culture. But bridging the gap, Japanese have pe people have trouble understanding American people. American people have trouble understanding Japanese people. And when we have cultural exchanges or extended travel, we talk about culture shock. Imagine so. living every day, all day, your entire life in culture shock yeah. over and over and over again. You could see how that might be traumatizing yeah. and lead to what look like symptoms of autism that are symptoms of what I would say are culture shock, repeated chronic culture shock. And You're that's gonna the thing. do things. Yeah, because neurotypical people, uh, I have been told this explicitly by former supervisors, uh, neurotypical people believe that uh, depression and anxiety are just natural parts of autism, but they're not. They're, they're a result of constant butting heads with people of a different culture, of a neurotypical culture, because we do things one way, they do things another, and it's it's... It might be right for each neurotype, but it's not right to impose that upon us because that will make us depressed and anxious and traumatized. Yeah. So I was an exchange student. I also hosted exchange students and I was a uh, volunteer representative uh, kind of like coaching. It's called a liaison coaching exchange students. And the first thing we tell exchange students before you leave after you arrive on regular basis, and it's mandated by the State Department to tell you this, is about three months in, you're going to have extreme depression and anxiety. Yeah. When you come to America, thank you, deep, fr deep fried cheese. Uh, when you come to America, you're going to gain a lot of weight. Yeah. You're ah! going to have body <laughs> dysmorphia. So most of our exchange students by three months in have gained 10 to 15 pounds. They don't fit in any of their clothes from home. They're depressed and anxious. And we don't pathologize it. We actually have training and support set up. So we tell people this is what's going to happen. We tell them you're going to need some accommodations. We say, here's what the accommodations will look like. 
And then there is mandated State Department support. So as a volunteer, I had to be trained. We were trained by therapists and we're told, here are some tools for managing things like weight gain, depression, cutting. Uh, isolation is a big one. So our exchange students will want to stay in their room. They won't want to talk to people. Three months in for most of our exchange students is the holidays. And so we tie it to homesickness, but that's not pathologized. Right. We keep telling them they're normal. This is a normal part. Every exchange student goes through this. This is culture shock. And there's no, we're not trying to fix them. I mean, we're trying to help them because depression is no fun. Right. But we're not like you are fundamentally broken because you are having a reaction to living in another culture where those things we talked about, your values, your beliefs, the way you communicate, the way you behave, how the society functions, every single one of those is different and it's fucking with your head. That makes sense as opposed to every single one of those things is different. You're screwed up. Why don't you get with the program and do things our way? I find it fascinatingly self-aware that they say, yes, there are a number of really unhealthy aspects of our culture that is that have negative effects on you. And that's totally legit. Uh, let us help you with it. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that is unbelievably self-aware. Right. And and these programs started after World War II. I mean, I'm sure there have been improvements, but I was an exchange student in 1989, and they did this for me. And then wow. I'm still doing it with our exchange students today. We have students on the YES program that come from uh, Muslim countries, and we talk about all the special situations that you're going to run into with the your country's culture being Muslim, being Muslim in America after 9-11, like this is not new. It's just not pathologized. And that's what it looks like when it's not pathologized. Yeah. Yeah. It, that, and that all goes back to the that like whole thing about uh, quote unquote cultural paranoia, because mm -hmm. again, you know, it, it's not paranoia if your culture is legitimately treated poorly by the majority. Right. And that, the, or I, not I can, even treated like a culture, treated like a disease. Imagine if we taught, if we treated Muslims like they had a disease. Oh, wait, I imagined yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I just yeah. imagined it. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well, hmm. welcome to America. That is, <laughs> I, I, I legitimately feel pain for any people from Muslim countries coming here in uh, currently. Uh, uh, but again, it's much and you know like what we do? Yeah. We give the as exchange students, we give them lots of extra support. Good. The YES program has extra support because we're like, oh, you have extra things to deal with. So maybe you're an autistic person that doesn't speak. You might yeah. need extra support, like different supports, different ways of being support. Like there are no one exchange student is treated the exact same way. We've got some basic toolkits, some principles, and then we apply them to each kid based on their needs. Yes, that is fantastic. We need that for us. Yes, that's what we're doing here. Ooh. So a lot of the work with exchange programs, it's actually, this is the um, I think it is the number one most used social science theory, most quoted, most cited, most applied. Um, and this theory is the theory of cultural dimension. So Geert Hofstadter is a Dutch social psychologist, and he developed a framework for measuring cultural dimensions from a global perspective. Basically, Everyone who's anyone uses this. Exchange programs use it, for sure. Uh, the Hofstadter cultural dimensions theory. But also, if you work for like, um, uh, like a multinational corporation, and let's say they're sending you... I had a, a friend from Washington, D.C., who is working in New York for IBM, and they sent her to France. They put her through a Hofstadter cultural dimensions training about all these things that would be different in France. And the company paid for it and uh, trained her, but also then here's how we work with these differences. And every big multinational company does this. Like I said, exchange programs do this. 
many, many, many academic studies. So this is social science we are talking about now. So they're st- some of them are good, some of them are bad, but they're studies with controls, with academics that are measuring numbers and traits. And he is looking at six dimensions. There are some arguments about others I will talk to you about, but we're going to start with the key six dimensions that were core to this research and have followed through. So the, these are the six, power distance, individualism, uncertainty avoidance, something that was originally called masculinity. I'll get into that's changed a little bit, but long-term orientation and indulgence versus restraint. Ooh, and oh, those are good ones. Yeah. So each of these, a culture is going to have a rating on an index from one to a hundred on how you rate. So each of these is a scale. So the first scale is individualism versus collectivism. Um, and I'm going to give you a little bit to read about individualism versus collectivism. In individualistic societies, members consider themselves independent from others. People define themselves in terms of I and their unique attributes. Autonomy and independent thought are valued, and the interests and goals of the individual prevail over group welfare. Personal attitudes and needs are important determinants of behavior. In cultures that emphasize the individual, ties between members are loose, nuclear families are more common than extended families, love carries greater weight in marriage decisions, and divorce rates are higher. Members of individualistic cultures are likely to engage in activities alone, and social interactions are shorter and less intimate, although they are more frequent. Right. And collectivism is obviously the opposite of that. So you're going to put the family first. You're going to make decisions that are uh, you're going to engage in activities that are more often with your family or with the community. Nuclear families are going to be more common and the greater good comes first. So what when we just talk about this one, what cultures come to mind for you country wise as particularly individualistic or collectivist? Uh, well, well uh, collectivist would be more uh Eastern or Western countries. No, no, no. Uh, yeah. Eastern. Eastern yeah. yeah. Uh, Japan, uh, trying yep. to figure out where we are on the globe. Yeah. <laughs> it depends uh, on which map you're looking at. <laughs> yeah. And that's the thing, because uh, when I think of a globe, I picture North America right there front and center because I wonder we why. So, so individualistic that says USA. USA. <laughs> yeah, that sort of says it right there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's the thing. Everything is about. I got mine, Jack. I don't care about your needs. No universal health care for you. Right. So, uh, right. So if we were to look at a scale from Japan to the U.S., this is part of why a Japanese exchange student is going to have culture shock. Why are all these people making such selfish decisions? What fucking yes. weirdos? Are yeah. you not thinking about your family? Like, you're not thinking about your grandmother. You're just going to not wear a mask and your grandmother can die. Right. Like yeah, makes a country no of sense. Sociopaths. Yeah. Yes. So uh, the U.S. is a ninety-one. So oh, yeah, a hundred nice. would be the most individualistic, and a one. And I don't think Japanese is a one. I think it's like a thirteen. I didn't rank that one, but uh, so that's going to be our range somewhere in there uh, from Japan to the U.S. Where would you put autism? That's the thing that, so, so here's the big thing about that. We grow up with this pathologized state telling us that we are weird and alone. So therefore we isolate. But the thing about that is when we find other autistic people, when we know that our families are autistic, we are incredibly social. We co-regulate with other autistic people. Our emotional states depending on vibing with other people. We need that community. We need that autistic people. So we are inherently a collectivist culture, but we are due to pathologization. We are isolated and broken off. This is So this is the thing about autistica. We are a diaspora at heart because we have been broken off from our mm. main country, our main selves and scattered to the wind. 
-hmm. And when we find each other, it's like finding light in the darkness because we find someone who finally gets who we are. And you, you may you may not experience that with every autistic person because again, variations in humanity and all, but when we vibe with somebody, we really, really, really vibe. And that big vibe is big collectivist culture. We, I we, think so. My yeah. other point I want us to talk about a little bit is social justice. Oh yeah. That's a big one. So uh, when you, when you think about America being a 91, mm -hmm. Right. On this scale, there is not that there are not many people committed to social justice in America, but as a society, we are very libertarian. Like we were founded on, you know, get rid of the taxes, get rid of the royals, each man for himself, subsistence farming, like manifest destiny, go pan for gold. Like that is a very individualistic approach. And we know that autistic people are drawn towards social justice. And part of why is that individual approach hurts people who have less power in the society. And we think everyone should be included. Yeah. And uh, so when yeah. I did this analysis, now there is, uh, if you're at a university and you would like to do this research, I will partner with you. Uh, there is not official research on our country, but there is a model for how to do this uh, in other countries. I went through that body of research in JSTOR. Did that work for you? You're welcome. And I guess, so a lot of what they do is they'll interview 10,000 Japanese people. They do data analysis. They do uh, quantitative and qualitative analysis. I couldn't do all of that, but I gave us a 49 on the scale. Neat. That was my guess. I think we lean slightly. There is a lot of individualism in our um, culture because of monotropism, because we uh, need to regulate our sensory systems. We need to spend time alone. But we really do a little bit more often than normal, if not pathologized, put the community first, the, the greater good slightly ahead of our own in general. Now, not a scientific study. That's my guess. And, and that brings what up a thing think? about like parallel play, because mm -hmm. while, while we do put the autonomous in the autism by doing things by ourselves, we like to do things by ourselves with others. We might sit in the same room and read books silently. We might sit in the same room, and play video games silently, but it's good to have somebody else nearby, even if we're not doing it together. So our our definition of togetherness looks very, very different from other people's definition of togetherness, which is, again, why we might look like we're aloof. We might look like we're antisocial, but that's just not how we define togetherness. That's not how our people define collectivism. And I, I think that I, I think that defining things from a neurotypical perspective is very problematic and that we need our own vocabulary. We need our own criteria for evaluating such things. But because of the years and years and years of pathologization, we don't have a good research base for doing that. Okay, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. We love sharing stories of autistic culture. And if you are seeing yourself in any of these stories, and you're wondering if maybe you're one of us or maybe you're already diagnosed or self-diagnosed and you want to know if Matt can help you live your life better and be more authentically autistic. Check out his website at mattlowerylpp.com. That's Matt, M-A-T-T, Lowry, L-O-W-R-Y. And then that LPP, it stands for Licensed Psychological Practitioner. So head on over to mattlowerylpp.com and learn more about working with my buddy, Matt. That when you look at these power dimensions, some some of the other, I'm sorry, cultural dimensions, some of these will come into um, better focus when we compare them to other things. It is a spectrum. It looks like a spectrum and every country has this cute little graph that Hofstadter came up with. So you could, if you knew the work well enough, just look at a graph and say, oh, that's the, that's the culture. Mm -hmm. And when you 
look at this particular individual focus versus group focus um, in the context an individual culture would prefer using communication skills to get short-term rewards while um, a more group focused culture would opt for using their power of communication to gain long term rewards. And then we're going to talk about that long term orientation. So when we get to that part of the spectrum, you'll see how this idea of individualism versus collectivism doesn't just exist alone. It's the way the six dimensions uh, interact with each other. I like that. Okay. So our next one is power distance. You're going to like this one. It's right up your PDA alley. (laughs) Read this. (laughs) Power distance is concerned with the extent to which a community accepts and endorses authority, power differences, and status privileges. In low power distance societies, members believe that inequalities should be minimized. Power is seen as a source of corruption, coercion, and dominance. People recognize one another as moral equals with shared basic human interests. Members care about the welfare of others and cooperate with one another. Oh, man. We got some stuff to talk about this. Oh, Matt. Oh, Matt. Yeah. Now, listen, not everybody in Autistica is PDA. So this this is a fascinating thing that I have learned because, again, I do autism evaluations and I'm autistic. So I look at things from a strength based model. Right. But I have learned through uh, doing trainings uh, that neurotypicals do things very differently. I did a training under one neurotypical woman and she was talking about she was doing an evaluation with an autistic girl. And she said that she was, quote, horrified by the child's lack of a natural fear of adults. Mm, that sounds great. That That is mm. fascinating. And the, the co-host on this said, oh, yes, I could totally see that. Because their perspective is that there needs to be a power hierarchy, that there needs to be this uh, chain of command, and that people who are lower on this chain of command, i.e. children, need to have this natural fear of authority and do what the authoritarians say. That's that's like breeding ground for fascism. And it it fascinates me that this is a model that neurotypical people work by. This is why so many autistic kids have difficulty in school because they treat the teacher as a human being instead of a superior. They they treat the principal Mm -hmm. as a human being instead of a superior. Let's talk about doctor. I know we did a whole episode. Yes, yes, exactly. This is a big one. Yes. I remember going to kids' houses and in our house, we were, um, adults were called by their first name. I mean, obviously I called my mom, mom, but I would call her friends by their first name. But in other kids' houses, they were called like Mrs. Smith, Mrs. Jones. They love honorifics. Go uh, on. Right. And then I had, um, particularly my black friends they would always say Miss or Mr. and the first name. So it was like Miss Angela, Mr. Matt. And I was like observant. I obviously didn't know about Hofstadter's model, but I was like from house to house, the power distance index changes, Yeah, which you know I do real well with changes. How do I know which one it is? And then I heard about this school. It was called the Independent Day School, and they called their teachers by their first name. Fascinating. My mind was blown. I was like, I must go to school there. My whole reason was they called their teachers by their first name instead of Mr. or Miss. And I didn't really like calling my teachers Mr. or Mrs. because it automatically gave them this power. And half the time they got the information wrong, which I was very happy to correct them on. Yeah, so of course. So why are we pretending based on your name? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this is a big problem for our people interacting in a society that demands this this false valuation based on e- either credentials or age or just other uh, attained status. It's very confusing. You're just going to say they're right because they have authority, but what if they're wrong? Yeah, 
Exactly. What do you, you, you're supposed to lie, but you told me never to lie. So yeah, never yeah. lie, except in cases where someone has a greater power distance than you, in which case, can you give me the instructions for when I'm supposed to lie? And what if I'm allowed to call them their first name? Then yeah. I don't lie, but they're yeah. like, ah, it's too many rules and it doesn't make sense. And I'm very sorry, but I, this is why I can't do multiple choice questions. Yeah. I have yeah. many answers. Yeah. So the, yeah, the uh, rules are weird, complicated, and arbitrary. Yes. So uh, the U.S. is a forty power uh, power distance index. If we were to look at a country like, let's say, China, it might be like a ninety power index. Like I we're going to listen that. to our elders. Yeah. Where do you put? I'll tell you my number. I came up with <laughs> looking at the studies. Where would you put the autistic culture power distance index? I, I would say somewhere in the twenties. Okay, I went for nineteen. <laughs> oh well, there you go then. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, the UK is thirty-five. Holland yeah. is thirty-eight. I'm like, we're definitely, and like Holland is very low power. And my experience with Dutch people is they're usually, they don't suffer fools either. I was surprised it came out at 38. But when I thought about the UK, where my experience is, they're at least as differential as we are in the US. The US was a 40. I'm like, eh, I don't think we're like US, UK, Dutch culture, I think we have a lower power index. I yeah. think we are on the extreme end of power index. I would say so, yeah. And you can already start to see the interplay now between power index and individualism. Like if we're 49 on the individualism spectrum, but we're way down here at 19 for the power distance, Okay, that's going to tell us the way our individualism looks is different, but we're going to add in another category and uh, you'll like this one. This next dimension of culture is called uncertainty avoidance. Ooh, it's a long oh, one. Wow. But oh, this, this is a good one. <clears throat> uncertainty avoidance is concerned with the extent to which uncertainty is tolerated and the preference for rules or in order. This refers to the, the oh, sorry, this refers to the ability of societies to comfortably navigate uncertain, uncertainty. As the communication process is fraught with ambiguity in the initial stage when everything is usually unresolved, a communicator with more uncertainty avoidance would be less effective in navigating concerns and sharing information than one with less uncertainty avoidance. In strong uncertainty avoidance societies, members are threatened by uncertainty, have an emotional need for predictability, huh, and mm -hmm. exhibit a high resistance to change. No kidding. What? <laughs> the resistance is expressed through nervousness, stress, and attempts to control the environment. Members formalize their interaction with others, verify communications in writing, and take no more relatively more moderate and calculated risks. Uh, take more relatively more moderate and calculated risks. Mm. In strong uncertainty avoidance societies, members hold rigid beliefs. There are strict behavioral norms, former rules in law, and an intolerance of rule breaking or unorthodox ideas and behaviors. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Our expectation <laughs> sensitivity puts us right on there, huh? Oh. Oh, yeah. So if you look at a culture um, and some of this, again, colonialization, like lot, there are lots of reasons for this. But when you do these studies that have been going on for decades, a country like India has an extremely low uncertainty avoidance index. So India is like, we don't know who's ruling us. We don't know if we're going to eat today. We're just going to make the best of it. We're going to church. Yeah. So they are about a 10 or a 15. They have and Africa would be the same way. A lot of developing nations. Haiti right now probably has a uncertainty avoidance index of one. Like who fucking knows? Yeah. If you look at a country like Germany, they have a much higher number. So Germany is a 62. Holland is a 53. So they're like, give us more rules. We would prefer that. So when you think of a country that's like ordered and structured and lots of rules, they're going to have the higher number. The U.S. sits about in the middle. So it's a 46. Interesting. 
And uh, having a British husband, this one felt really right to me. The UK is a 35. So remember, they went through being the number one colonial power and then it all collapsed. And there is a recent memory of that. And they now have a pretty high uncertainty avoidance. And that's what the keep calm and carry on stuff is all about. That is interesting. I was wondering about that. Yeah. So it's a cultural thing why that started there. Uh, on the scale of India to Germany, which Man. goes from, let's say, 10 to 60, where do you put autistic culture? I'll tell you my number. It's pretty funny. So that that is an interesting question because, uh, first of all, we would prefer to be in charge of our own stuff, but yet we also need to learn what rules and expectations have for us. This is, uh, So this actually brings up a, a neat thing with, well, not neat, but tragic. Uh, a tragic thing with, uh, for instance, African-American communities are mm. targeted directly by ABA because of a fear of being murdered by police. Mm -hmm. Because... Black autistic families, uh, they they want to know that their kids will be compliant and not be murdered. Mm. So ABA targets black families to mm. get that compliance mm. factor. So mm. when we talk about removing ABA and finding something better, we talk about how we can still protect these families from a structure that doesn't understand us, doesn't care to understand us, but yet we, we need to navigate it anyway. So th this is all about understanding the rules without it breaking us. This is all about understanding what we need to do in order to survive, understanding this uncertainty in the face of people who would impose their rules upon us without first telling us that. So yeah, given all that, I honestly have no idea because we definitely want the structure, but we are in a structure that goes against our natural structure. So you have a structure on structure right. combat but there. In this framework, in Hofstadter's framework, it's a country. So we all live together. So we're oh, imagining autistica. We're imagining your the you know, your world that you created in the legend of autistica. Like and we all live together. And if we all live together, I'm t my number was 100 because yeah. we made the rules. We voted on the rules. We decided on the rules. Do not change the motherfucking rules. Everybody <laughs> so, agrees what is best so that we can live together and do our own thing in harmony. Uh-huh. And, um, and also, if you're going to change them, we need some rules about how the rules are changed. Thank you very much. Exactly. So in our magical land of autistica, I gave us a hundred on uncertainty, uncertainty avoidance. We would like no uncertainty. The uncertainty is what leads to the behaviors that lead to the pathologization, pathologization, get rid of that. And we just have a town that runs on time. I lived in Switzerland for a few years. My favorite point part of living in Switzerland, there were many not favorite parts, uh, but was the uncertainty avoidance. There's very little uncertainty in Switzerland. They just took care of that. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, our next category, and remember, these all um, these all interact with each other. They don't stand alone. But um, so Hofstadter is he died in 2020, but he died in his 80s in 2020. So this system is old and we're going to use some patriarchal language here. But this is what Hoff Stater says about masculinity versus femininity. And then we're going to talk about the masculinity scale. Oh boy. Masculinity versus femininity. According to Hofstetter, cultures that prefer assertiveness, heroism, material reward, and achievement are more masculine, while those that prefer modesty, cooperation, quality of life, and caring for the weak are more feminine. Boy, the okay, manosphere must I roll love that. Here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We have fixed this, uh, you know, at least a little bit. They have fixed this. But... There's such a body of research, we can't just throw it out. So this is called the masculinity scale. And uh, a one would be Lesboa, would be the land of Wonder Woman, right? Yeah. It is a totally feminine world, although it's very masculine, so that's a bad example. But one is totally feminine. A hundred is Andrew Tate, totally masculine. And they have now changed this and they call it gender egalitarianism, which is better. 
So here's how they describe it now. Gender egalitarianism is concerned with the extent to which a society differentiates gender roles. In high gender egalitarian culture, male social and emotional roles are similar to female roles. Both men and women are modest, cooperative, tender, and concerned with quality of life and caring for those who need more help. There are more women in positions of authority, a higher percentage of women participating in the labor force, and less occupational sex segregation. Females and males have similar levels of education and literacy, hold jobs with similar status and pay, and play an equal role in community decision making. Oh, yeah, that's that's definitely it's us. Especially, I'm yeah. going to upgrade that to, I don't, it's a spectrum. Like, I don't know that there are just females and males. That seems, I suspect that's a little bit limited. But I get yeah. where you guys are going with that. And here is where we talk about uh, the intersection of queer culture yeah. and autistic culture. So, uh, you know, just kind of spin us with what comes up for you when you think about gender egalitarianism in autistic culture. Well, we have a thing called autogender because lots of, for instance, you know, gender roles and gender norms are very much social constructs. And because we see all that as complete bullshit, we tend not to adhere to that sort of stuff. Uh, I am a very tender and loving father. I did a lot of my child's care when he was a baby. And uh, uh, no one believes it because I'm a big burly dude and big burly dudes go out and work and chop meat or something. I don't know. You prefer modesty. Oh, wait, yeah. no, you prefer assertiveness, heroism, material ward, and achievement. Yeah, I go, I go out and kill boars for a living or something. Yes. I bring meat, you cook. Yeah. Lady cook yeah. for me. Exactly. Uh, yeah, so uh, U.S., where would you, where, just guess. It's fun. Oh, Let's God. guess numbers. Where do you uh, think the U.S. falls on the scale of uh, Wonder Woman to Andrew Tate? <laughs> uh, I would say Andrew Tate with an additional four or five penises. <laughs> Oh, well, it's not that bad. There are enough of us here. The U.S. is a 62, so it's oh, bad, <laughs> but it's yeah. not quite as bad. But if you look at a lot of the Asian cultures, it's actually higher. So like Japan and uh, India, they're like in the 80s. The U.K. ties with the U.S. at 62. And let's hear it for our Dutch brethren. The Dutch come in at 14. The, our Dutch sister in then. Yeah. That's interesting. And that's about where I put us. So I put autistic culture at a 10 yeah. on this scale. Uh, not a scale of feminine to masculine, but a scale of more gender egalitarianism to less gender egalitarianism. Especially for the fact that we tend not to see gender as a binary. I mean, that in itself right. is a gigantic factor in all this. Right. And I was like, look, if Holland gets a 14, uh, Autistica is going to do better than that. Oh, so. God, yes. Um, okay, our next category, and we've got two more. So you guys are doing a great job hanging in there, learning about the uh, science behind Autistica culture dimensions. Um, but this one is orientation to time. And we're going to talk about a long-term orientation versus a short-term orientation. Here's a little bit about that. Members of short-term orientation society short-term oriented societies are more focused on the present and past than on the future they value instant satisfaction members spend now rather than save for the future they live in the moment and are not concerned with past or future anxieties on the flip side members of short-term oriented societies may engage in risky pleasure-seeking pursuits and fail to recognize the negative longer-term implications of their indulgences long-term orientation first oh I think that's a, that might be that might oh. be an edit. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Hold on, I'm gonna give you the rest. I cut off that sentence. This dimension refers to whether people value short-term or long-term goals and achievements. For example, a communicator with a long-term orientation would prefer gaining value with their communication in the future. In contrast, someone who is oriented to the short term would opt for achieving immediate gains through their communication. So. Yeah. Interesting, right? So if Very. you're thinking in Autistica, let's say I'm having a sensory overload moment, and a lot of these studies are like that marshmallow study about like instant gratification and stuff like that. So you're having sensory overload. I don't know, some lady has smelly perfume. You have to get out of the store. Are you, and let's just say you happen to be nonverbal and don't tend to use 
you know, words as your communication go-to method, what would you be thinking of with your communication, your long-term needs or your short-term needs? I, I would dare say that the, the thinking would be minimal because that would be a fight or flight response. Fight or flight. Yeah, exactly. So because so much of our communication is related to sensory things, joy, I love this tower, you know, like this is an awesome tower in the toy store, or like this is loud, that light is buzzing and I'm going to murder someone if I have to hear that light buzzing. I think our culture orients more towards the short term because we are, I mean, I think there are some, you know, issues with the way this is framed. Um, but what what we often need with our communication is right now. So thoughts on that? I, I so this I, I, like with the you know the the thing before about you know living in just autistica without this kind of stuff in autistica we wouldn't have that sensory overload in autistica. No, but we might because some people like smelly things or bright things or shiny things, and some people don't. So you'd still have. Or like other people's stems. So like I love other people's stems. Other people's stems also drive me fucking crazy. Uh, yes, exactly. So I'm like hypersensitive to people's stems, but I also know what's happening. But that doesn't mean I don't have a short-term communication need, which is like that needs to not fucking happen. Yeah, yeah. But it, that's the thing from an autistic perspective. Everyone understands that some things are triggering and some things are not triggering. So you say, I can't deal with that. Can you stop? And you say, oh, well, I understand what it's not like. Because that's yeah. the thing. In, in the contrast. That's why I think we're short term. Yeah. Short term. But it wouldn't be pathologized. It would be just short term and delightful. Like, hey, yeah. I, do you mind if I go in the other room? Because the light in here is bothering me. Yeah. Yeah. And, <laughs> and be, But because of the monotropism and everything. We have long-term goals like, you know, do you want to work together on this Minecraft kingdom and develop everything in here? Every so, single thing in it. Exactly. That's the thing. There's so much to do and so much to be done that, you know, we, we do value that. So that is a very interesting contrast in needs versus goals. Right. But again, this is a spectrum. And even though we might be building you know, Pokemon, which is like a very long-term orientation. If I were miserable building Pokemon and I hated it, I wouldn't be able to do it. Like part of yeah. monotropism includes the joy in the moment. Yes. So if you look at, I'm going to give you a little scale here. So if you look at uh, Asian cultures, Japan, China, India, they tend to be on the long term, like we're going to stick this out no matter what. Uh, many established Western European countries are also like that. So Holland is a 67 on the scale. The I like UK that. is a 51 on the scale. Yeah. Um, so right about in the middle, but they've got a long term view. The US is a 26. I could see that. Short term, I want my needs met right now, ties in with the individualistic. But if you go to a more collectivist culture with a lower power index and more gender equality, now if you add short term orientation to time, it's a very different place. So I put us up below the U.S. I think the U.S. in general has a slightly longer term view than autistic culture. I put us at a 20. Interesting. So who knows? We got to get some academic to do the actual study. But OK, here's our last category um, as we wrap up these six dimensions. And this one is um, called indulgence versus restraint. You could read In this one. Indulgence oriented societies encourage pleasure seeking. Members pursue fun activities for the sake of personal enjoyment. In contrast, restraint societies believe that hedonistic pleasure needs to be curbed and regulated by strict social norms. 
I, yes. man, we, we are, uh, <laughs> I don't think that we can function without pleasure seeking. Uh, we, right. we are not a, th so uh, this is one thing that I tell people a lot that uh, I believe that neurotypical culture is very much uh, constantly saying, have you tried just suffering? <laughs> right. Because that, that is, seems to be the way it's very Puritan oriented and saying, yes, we should definitely toil 24 seven because that is the way. But we cannot do that because if we don't vibe with it, if we don't get that monotropic joy, we cannot stay focused on it because we'll just die. Right. Yes. So an indulgent uh, score would be lower. A restraint score would be higher. Holland, the U.S. and the U.K. all come out around 68, 69. Um. I put us a little lower on that scale, more towards indulgent in the 40s. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my, my son loves to run around naked and refuses to put on pants, so we order DoorDash a lot because that way he doesn't have to wear pants because, you yes, know, this is the way. Yeah, but autistic joy in general often and, and sensory seeking, like those are much more enjoyable for us. So it makes sense that we would want more of it because yeah. we're experiencing it at a bigger level. Yeah. Yeah. We, we have that joy that uh, others don't. And it's, it's painful to not, it's painful to be deprived of it. So we, we live lives. For instance, I'm sitting here in sweatpants and bare feet because I'm a raging hedonist. And yeah, it, this is the way uh, if we can find a way that works around our needs and gets our joy needs met, uh, I think that that's the way to go. We're going to go for it. Okay. So wrapping up these, the six established areas, individualism versus collectivism. We're at about the halfway point, low power versus high power. We are a low power society in the bottom 25% there. Uncertainty avoidance. Uh, we would like to avoid uncertainty. So we are a high uncertainty avoidance culture. Gender egalitarianism is very important to us. So we have what is low masculinity. It gives us a 10 score, but that means high gender egalitarianism. It's just that it's an old scale. Orientation to time, I put us in the bottom 25% for orientation to time. We are short-term versus long-term oriented. And uh, indulgence versus restraint, I put us in the bottom half leaning towards indulgence rather than restraint. That is the scientific analysis of our culture based on the very famous Gert Hofstadter uh, cultural dimension survey. That is my uh, non-academic analysis. There are a couple of other um, categories that are part of culture that I just want to talk about quickly. One of them is high assertiveness and competitiveness. Um, and those come up a lot. So in low context versus high context communication styles, you would be um, in a, uh, you would be more assertive uh, performance is rewarded and results are stressed over relationships. So the question is, what's more important, the outcome or the relationship? This crosses over a lot of the other categories, but it has been studied. And I would say we are much more outcome oriented. Um, not that relationships aren't important to us. I know I have been called in the workplace transactional many times. Um, it feels more like honesty to me. There's a lot in this work about face saving. Um, and so in high assertive cultures, it's bad for face saving because in high assertive cultures, they are direct and they value expressing thoughts and feelings, which is apparently not good for emperor neurotypicalis at, as one example. I, I, I remember as a child, my father tried to tell me that dogs don't actually love people because they're just in it for the food. And I said... So humans are the same. That's why I'm here. Hey, hey newsflash. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He was very offended by that. 
Yeah, apparently you're not supposed to say stuff like that. Yeah, turns yeah. Out. I always say this is why when the revolution comes, the autistic people like me will be up against the wall first. So it's not yeah. it's not great. We're not good at uh, putting the uh, needs of the community first in case of logic. Thanks for listening to the Autistic Culture Podcast. We'll be right back. When autistic people find a special interest, they go deep and have a lot of knowledge, even if they don't have that formal education background to go with it. If you want to capture your spin in a book, check out Angela's work at differencepress.com, differencepress.com, and find out more about becoming an author and establishing your credibility with a book. The next one is interesting. I didn't know what to do with this, but there have been some studies about incorporating this as, as another eighth dimension, um, and that is being versus doing. A being orientation stresses fitting into the world as it is, appreciating and understanding the world and not trying to change it. And the values are world peace, unity with nature, protecting the environment. Okay. Uh, then they tend to have a low sense of urgency. They, they are not motivated by money. They don't like cultures that are oriented to money. They're a being culture and they are oriented to experiences. A high doing culture, uh, people want control over their destiny. Anyone can succeed if you try hard enough. Self-assertion uh, is key. Mastery over the natural environment and a can-do attitude. So these put schooling and education first. Uh, a high doing society uh, is more about a sense of urgency and they record and they reward innovation with excellence. So I think maybe we err towards being. I, I, I would say so, because we, we are very given our love of gardens and animals and uh, libraries and stuff rather than, I don't know challenging other people for dominance and duels yeah yeah exactly i i would definitely agree with you on that because we just want to do our thing yeah and it's very it, it's a peaceful life yeah so less studies on those two categories the main ones are the six ones and then what happens is they merge they create this spectrum. They create this diagram. And I'll put some examples in the show notes. And then they lead to behaviors, not any one individual item, but how they interact. So we talked a little bit earlier, and I'll kind of wrap it up with these points, but we talked about eye contact. So if you have a high power um, differential. Like, so if you defer to authority, very often the way that will show up is uh, direct eye contact. Like in Indonesia, direct eye contact is seen as disrespectful because you're saying we're equals instead of acknowledging you're more powerful. So when you look at us culturally in Autistica, we don't necessarily value eye contact either, although you're eye contacting me, which is making me very uncomfortable. Why do yeah, I exactly. contact me? Yeah. Why are yeah. you looking at me like that? Did I do something wrong? Is something yeah. in my teeth? What's yeah. happening? Am yeah. I in trouble? Look at my eyeballs. What's happening? Why are we looking at me? So, but our reason would have to do with other things. For instance, it could be uncertainty avoidance. It could be um, our our um, our orientation to time. If I look up at you and I'm trying to get a result from something, um, so there are other reasons where we see the same cultural behavior. So while we share the behavior with Indonesians of not valuing eye contact, we value it for a different reason. Another example is touching. So Ooh. how you take up space, it's polite to leave a certain amount of space in certain cultures. And then in others, if you leave that, it's seen as very rude. Again, these have to do with how those features interplay with each other. Mm -hmm. 
And for us, part of our culture comes from our biological makeup. And I would say, well, I don't know. We have an interest. Sometimes we want more space and sometimes we want to crawl inside you. So well, well, that's the thing with somebody that I trust. I'm, I'm okay with constant touch. Otherwise I need at least three seats buffers when I go to the movies Correct. because I don't want anyone around me at any time ever. So yeah. uh, don't look at me. Don't touch me. That's that, those are the rules. So it might seem like the cultural things are the no eye contact or the no touching, uh, but those are actually the results of the dimensions that we talked about. And I think that's super important to understand as we analyze autism, autistic culture, autistic people as part of a culture. That's why sometimes it'll manifest because we are a diaspora Sometimes it'll manifest as I will make lots of eye contact because uh, I was taught you shake people's hand and you look them in the eye and, you know, that was beaten into me and I learned that masking skill, but that's not necessarily part of the culture. So teasing out what is pathologized reactions versus what is the true culture is part of my goal with this very scientific, academic -y deep dive into the world of Garrett Hofstadter and the cultural dimensions. I like that. I like that a lot. So did you learn anything new today? No, oh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I like the fact that we can quantify these things and with labels and have data and uh, analyze things because... I love an analyzing things. That's what we do. All right. So tell us one thing about being autistic that you absolutely loved this week. So, oh, okay. So I have been going on a deep dive of several hours a night, uh, all kinds of different things because my, for years, when my son was a baby, he discovered the opening of Disney movies had castles in them. And the, the the Disney logo is a castle. He loves the Disney castle. So at some point, I downloaded a YouTube compilation of all the openings of all the Disney movies with yeah. all the Cinderella castles. He loved it. So we have uh, Disney castle Lego sets, Disney castle play sets, Disney castle Funko Pops. He loves some castles. Uh, because he got a Happy Meal from Disney World uh, with Disney World uh card game in it he kept saying disney world disney world disney world I said would you like to see what disney world is like and he said okay so i brought up a walkthrough of the disney parks at which point his mind properly exploded because he was unaware that the disney castle is a real place that you can go to oh no it's so, all coming together this is getting to be expensive <laughs> that's, that's the thing so so he at that very moment at like 10 o'clock at night he jumps up puts on pants and he says, go to Disney, go to Disney now, put on clothes, go to Disney now. And I had to explain, well, son, that's a 12 hour trip. They're closed right now. We, we should probably go to bed ourselves, but he, <laughs> he is still very, very Disney focused. So I have been doing so much research, which actually will come up soon because of I'm the like, design of Epcot. Oh, there might be an episode. There, there, there is definitely going to be an episode in the future because there's some tism at work in the design there. Mm. But I have been researching three or four hours a night, looking at every podcast, looking at every web series I can on how to navigate the Disney parks, when to go when there's no people there, mm. uh, how to, when it is inexpensive, which is the best time of year. Have they do have like some nice special accommodations for autistic people. You can get they around do. the lines and they, they've definitely been thoughtful about building us into their and, money. And there are some times when you can go at night from like seven until one in the morning oh. when nobody's there. And like, ooh, that might be a thing. But it turns out that the next available time will be at the height of spring break. So oh. 
I don't know if I want to go with spring break, but it's it's something that we are looking into about how to avoid, how to be safe with COVID, where to go, where to stay, what to do, where all the rides are, which are the best rides. He is a train person, as we've previously said. He has been watching videos of Big Thunder Mountain and going, wee while they ride around. And he is That just, is one of my favorite rides. It's a yeah, good one. He, he wants to ride the Disney train. He wants to ride Big Thunder Mountain. He wants to ride the monorail. He He has his whole plan already planned out so we have been deep diving a lot and i love it when there's new stuff to research because it gives me plenty of it yes yes so much so many ins and outs so many of the intricacies the genie plus system the lightning lane system how to buy food where to buy food all the restaurants all the rides how to fit it all in yeah it it has been a trip and it has been uh, uh, an adrenaline rush for all of this new information. We may not even end up going. We'll go at some point, definitely, because we have to. But uh, you, get the, you get the benefits just from planning it. They say the benefits of planning a trip are the same as taking it. Exactly, exactly. Because, you know, it's it's just so fun learning about it. So, yeah, yeah that that uh, that monotropic focus, that high from the research, that data hunger, oh, it, it, it's hit both me and my autistic son really, really hard. And we've been having a fun time with it. I love it. Well, I hope Disney is in your future. And God knows there is a Disney culture. It might be a cult, though. Uh, hopefully, autistic culture is not a cult, but a culture. We're glad you're part of it and open to learning about it. Make sure you check out The Legend of Autistica on mattlowerylpp.com. We'll also put a link to it in the show notes. And uh, maybe we'll record a special episode of that very soon. Thanks for listening. Have a good one. Thanks for listening to the Autistic Culture Podcast. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. And remember, no one ever changed the world by being like everyone else. You can find out more about writing your book with me at differencepress.com. That's difference, D-I-F-F-E-R-E-N-C-E, press, P-R-E-S-S, dot com. Or... Getting a psychological evaluation or consult with me at www.mattlowrylpp.com. That's M A T T, Matt Lowry, L O W R Y, L P P, as in licensed psychological practitioner.com. <laughs>